ladies and gentlemen. The AHAX TV show is about to start. Ask questions via chat or Twitter. See you in a moment and every first Monday of the month, 8 p.m. CET, 6 p.m. UTC. Welcome to the uh, 95th edition of AHAX TV. And um, this time may be a little bit understandable. The last time there was a glitch with the uh, announcement uh, because I tested the connection up front and forgot to deactivate that. So I hope hopefully this time it works better. So I will double check the chat. So the chat is a little bit lazy today, but uh, I hope it 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 uh, will work well. So let's start right away with the first question um, or first topic. And where are the topics are here? So the very first one was Glassfish versus Payara. So I was completely wrong um, the last time. So not wrong. I have to apologize. I was incorrect. And um, I, I, I was pinged by Aryan Times. And who is Aryan Times? A great Jakarta E and Java E contributor. He was actually behind the Java E 8 security spec. And he said, okay, double check that because it's no more true that Payara is more popular than Glassfish. And what I actually did. So this is the GitHub Glassfish activity. And you can see that um, it actually, uh, uh, Glassfish becomes more and more popular over time. And one of the uh, biggest contributors is a gentleman, this is the Arian Times from Amsterdam. And by the way, he's also a consultant, so you can hire him and you get <laughs> possibly the best Java E consulting, microprofile Java E security consultant, uh, consulting ever. And uh, another gentleman called uh, David, uh, I hope, Matejcek. And, um, but uh, he is uh, um, already um, looks nice because fan of maintainable software and Jakarta E, which, <laughs> which um, is somehow compatible with the show. So I was curious and compare that with, um, so let's uh, close that with uh, Payara. And um, if you check out the, where is Payara? I think this is the Payara. So it also looks nice, um, but um, you see here the Pandrex was hyperactive. This is the Andrew Pillage and JB, and then uh, Stephen Millich, which who is actually the founder of Payara. But interestingly, uh, Steve Millich also contributes to, uh, to Glassfish, as you can see here. So um, I was curious, and I invited the uh, Aryan Times to Airhex FM podcast. Um, it is it is just recorded; it was not published yet. But uh, what's you know what's the secret behind all this? I ask you know Aryan, do you have too, too too much free time, or what's wrong with you that you are contributing to Glassfish, and we have already Payara around? And the reason for that is something called uh, Piranha Cloud, which is really interesting. This is an, I would say um, another kit on the block. It is not fully certified, but um, it is, I would say, 80% uh, certified micro-profile Jakarta E runtime, which is uh, very lean, very small, and uh, with isolated class loader, one of the main features. And uh, what uh, Arian is doing is very smart. What uh, Arian does is it uh, refactors the core of Glassfish, and then reuses the parts in Piranha Cloud, and Piranha Cloud could become in one uh, day a supported product. And uh, the Payara guys are also doing the same. They are contributing to Glassfish and then reusing the patches uh, for Payara. So, uh, so great news. So we not only have you know an active Glassfish again with Java 17 support, we also have uh, Piranha Cloud, but still. If you would like to use uh, a nice Java E runtime in production, I would uh, rather use Payara or Piranha Cloud now than store Glassfish because Glassfish has you know, like the nice foundation, but it's not uh, as well supported as Payara and Piranha Cloud. So um, this was one mystery you lifted here uh, at the AHEX TV show. Okay, so um, this was Piranha Cloud and now proceed with the next Next topic, and this is um, a friend of the show. I will have almost, or almost, I, I, Dimitri, if you ping me, I will send you a t-shirt, an AirHex TV t-shirt, because you're asking, you know, a really good questions. Um, and um, yeah, Dimitri Abkazi from Moscow. And um, he asked me a um, really nice question. Uh, tell us more about using Debezium. It's interesting to hear about real use in projects. 
why might it be necessary to broadcast events in the database to Kafka? And what I can share with you, not the details, because I always have to sign NDAs. This is one of the problems being consulting consultant, but I, I, I could roughly give you some ideas. So in one project, um, this actually I um, I uh, advise or I, I work with the developers for years already. So are they uh, they building a product? Um, and they they they, they built a product um, in the past for uh, different uh, runtimes, and the run runtimes were or or application servers, uh, WebSphere, Payara, uh, sorry Glassfish, then Payara, uh, then Whitefly, and now Quarkus. And they are very uh, productive with MicroProfile and very productive with SQL databases. So uh, they are database experts. So uh, they are thinking in SQL or dreaming about SQL, I would say, in a positive way. And now um, the problem we have right now is, um, you know, microservices. So um, they, they, they had a lots of microservices. And, and the problem with microservices is always, you know, the shared database. And uh, so they had the microservices, but um, my feeling was they were not really productive with the microservices because there was actually no reason of having, you know, several microservices. And I uh, said, okay, wh why we are building the microservices? We could just ship a monolith, what we did for years, and it will work perfectly. And I said, okay, but in future, maybe we we are missing out because maybe we would need, you know, the data somewhere else and uh, and and make it reusable. So in this particular project, what we are doing, uh, the microservices are working with a database, and every database, every table becomes a topic, and all the data is in topics once again. So, but now, what the Bizum actually does is one thing really well: in the writing or or in the write transaction to the database, uh, the uh, commit also happens for Kafka. Uh, so it means uh, we have tra transactional writes to two resources which is impossible without the Bezium. So in one transaction, we can store the data to the Postgres database and to Kafka at the same time. And um, so, so what we have then, we have all the data once again in Kafka. And what we can do right now is we can just uh, create a true microservices. We're just reading the data from Kafka and you know, and, and the developers can be very productive with the relational database. So for me, it is like best of both worlds. We can build productive monolith with Jakarta in MicroProfile. And on the other side, we can actually build um, um, streaming applications or how to call it, uh, true microservices because, you know, the uh, topics are shared, they are immutable, and we can build as many microservices we like uh, without, you know, sharing the database. One use case. Another use case similar to this one, except the client is thinking about clouds. So what we are going to do exactly the same with the Bizium. Now we, get, we, we have the guarantee that the entire data from the database is also available in Kafka. So we can push the data from Kafka to the cloud. And if no, if the connection is not, uh, not that great or whatever can happen, it is still um, secure. Because uh, what we can do is we can read from the Kafka topic and every successful read would advance the index and then we can push the data to the, uh, to the cloud. Um, this is like cloud integration. And um, another, uh, another project is like data lake. And what we do in this project, we have a huge database and uh, we cannot touch the database anymore because it's too big. And now all the future implementations happens in uh, Kafka and uh, um, uh, that there are uh, also the similar story. You know, we have uh, database experts, and now it's slightly different. So uh, the huge database is serialized to uh, to Kafka topics, and what we get is KSQLDB. It's similar to uh, Presto, and uh, Presto. There is no more Presto. The I uh, think is called Trino or tr uh, Trino or something like that, Trino right now. And uh, what it basically is, you can. Um, so, so the trick is the Bizium in my eyes is not as I would say um, it doesn't come with lots of advantages without using Kafka streams. So what Kafka streams are, you can use Java 8 like syntax to have analytics and you, you can write business logic around the topics. And what KSQLDB does, you can write ad hoc um, queries. You can combine the streams using you know, ad hoc syntax, you don't have to write code. So this is what I do with the Bizium. And for me, are true killer features. So we don't care about, you know, the output pack, uh, uh, 
Outbox, uh, Pattern. I don't think we mentioned CDC a lot. We just use it, and uh, and uh, and um, and no one wonders why because it fits it fits you know naturally to to the entire system. And um, I was always against uh, or against uh, Kafka as a replacement for JMS. I couldn't understand you know why someone would do this because of two different two different use cases. We had the discussion several times at the show, but um, I think now. Um, there are more and more use cases, especially now uh, in the recent two years. There's a you know movement to the cloud, which makes sense in lots of projects. And and Kafka is a great, um, I would say, a great uh, sync tool, which allows us to synchronously or synchronously to consistently write data from on-premise to the cloud. Okay, so uh, thank you, Dimitri. If you like, drop me your address, and I will send you something. Okay. Now, another friend of the show, Jeff Rogers from uh, Kearney. What is NE? I forgot it. Actually, I think you mentioned this already, so we'll have to click on that. Um, what, what are the reasons you would use CDI event and observes? I'm thinking specifically about communication between boundary and control layers, uh, BC structure to avoid dependencies between boundaries. Uh, I wouldn't do this. Um, I wouldn't like to decouple CDI because it is decoupled, but not decoupled. I mean, in the end of the day, you have a data coupling between layers. What is the killer use case of CDI and observes? Um, the observers are uh, transactional observers. So what you can do with that is, um, if you take a look at the um, at the CDI event transaction or search for Adam Bean CDI events and transactions, you will probably find a blog post. Actually, we can do this right now. Adam Bean CDI transactions. And um, very good. This is exactly what I wanted to show you today. So we have here, uh, this is seems like pretty old. How old is it? Um, yeah, <laughs> nine years old. But um, what you see here is um, transaction after success, after failure. Um, these are the listeners. And what happens now, I can send now an event here, fire. And this event is delivered on success if we know that the transaction commits, and on failure we know that it is it is getting to be invoked before the transaction rolls back. So what I could do with CDI events, I can integrate a non-transactional resource like, for instance, email. What I could do here is to send an event in case uh, on, oh, sorry, I send an email only in case uh, the transaction commits. And write another email or not email, uh, create an issue or ticket in case the transaction uh, rolls back. Nine years old post. Crazy. Okay. Now, Hans Georg Glöckler, friend of the show, and uh, they are building a great web component based system. And ask uh, me, you know, to, uh, to, to help them uh, from time. Hour-wise, I'm completely overbooked. Just ask questions here and you get them answered. So this was the deal with uh, Mr. Haglu. Uh, and they have a great, great team which are very passionate about web components. So the system is going to be great. But uh, he asked me, we have implemented a CD CDC with Postgres, Debezium, and Kafka, which is nice. All works. I just wonder why you did it. I think I can imagine uh, another great feature of uh, of this is, I don't know what your use case exactly is, but uh, we did it once and uh, for audits, the cool story is, if you are writing to a database, uh, then um, all the transactions are stored in Kafka. So you have like time traveling. So instead of using of Hibernate um, Enverse, you could actually use the BZM CDC. This is another use case, what you properly did. What is now the best way to visualize the CRUD statements which are saved via the BZM in Kafka? So why to visualize maybe a table because you see the entire history but um, how to get, you know, the um, the um, how to conveniently read the data again is you could use uh, Quarkus with microprofile reactive messaging, and you get in real time all the events on the other side, and then what you can do you can expose the events via WebSockets, so you can have like a bridge which reads from Kafka and sends via WebSockets or uh, SSE server sent events. So this would also work work perfectly. So and uh, the CRUD statements, you will see not only CRUD statements, you will see all transactions from the database with metadata, so which table was involved, 
and whether it was um, um, a create or update operation. You, you won't see any selects. So, another great question from Hans Georg or Mr. Haglu. Uh, have you experience uh, with uh, WebAssembly? Uh, yes, I mean, what's it's, it's not like a huge project. It's like, you know, uh, have you experience with bytecode, right? So you cannot write, or you shouldn't write WebAssembly directly. What you usually do, you, you have a language like Rust or C Sharp, and you cross-compile to WebAssembly. So what WebAssembly is, is like a, a subset, type-safe uh, <laughs> type subset of JavaScript. Why you would like to use WebAssembly? Because it's crazy fast and is executed directly in browser, and it can be also um, uh, executed in, in caches on edges. So this is also interesting. So you could use uh, WebAssembly to run, uh, I think Cloudflare, Cloudflare workers, for instance, uh, are supporting WebAssembly. Um, yeah, so um, you could. There are some open source tools which cross compile Java code to WebAssembly. Even better. If you search for GraalVM and WebAssembly, assembly, you can even, even execute WebAssembly in Java. So Java understands WebAssembly and Wasm. So uh, you could do this, it's experimental, but interesting. So why you would like to do that? Uh, maybe one reason could be uh, that you have like, you know, crypto code or uh, image resizing, something where DOM is not involved because um yeah uh, or or in, um uh, custom uh custom compression then i would see you know uh, you could use uh web, web assembly to uh to do that okay now um vexpath says hi adam i'm uh looking for integrating elastic search in whitefly with my sequel for improving searching so um first of all is it better to split my data between uh, between uh, to split my data between MySQL and Elasticsearch, or have Elasticsearch as a cache, which means data duplication? So I would say usually in such projects you get data duplication. So there will be like a key or link between uh, Elastic Cache and MySQL, and um, and you will get you know. Um, and uh, and uh, you will have to because Elastic Cache as a cache, what it means, write through cache, you know, uh, lazy loading cache, it is not as easy. Uh, we we always use we start the data in Elastic uh, Search once again, or at le uh, or not the entire data, just you know the relevant data with the key as a back reference to the real database. So uh, I have two options for the integration internally or externally. Using CDC approach like Debezium is good enough? Yes, um, but this is an extra complexity. I would say Debezium is fairly simple. Uh, the problem is you get uh, the Kafka. As, uh, if, you don't have, if you don't have Kafka installed yet, then you get uh, additional operational complexity because you will have to maintain Kafka. If you have uh, Kafka on premise, this is not a uh, I mean, then you already have it in the cloud. You can just, you know, use serverless Kafka or, uh, uh, yeah, or there are different plugins for Debezium. It don't, it doesn't even have to be to be Kafka. It can be a different tool like Apache Pulsar, for instance. Um, yeah. So um, you're right. If you don't have Kafka, avoid it. If you already have Kafka, it's not a big deal because you can reuse your brokers. Um, so, um, but it provides a good consistency model, actually a perfect consistency model, because uh, you are writing essentially in the da database transaction to Kafka. So it is like the same commit. Um, so, also if something goes wrong in ES, I can restore ES storage to a previous. Uh, yeah, uh, you, you can do this. Uh, you are correct on that. So you could do this. You can have uh, Debezium, which uh, writes transactionally to MySQL, and uh, the. Uh, what, what I'm talking about. You are writing to MySQL. MySQL writes transactionally to Kafka. And then you have a Kafka, how it's called, sync sync connector. So, and then you have a sync connector which reads uh, from, from the topics directly to Elasticsearch. Um, so you can do this. And internal integration uh, case, uh, case where, uh, exactly, where you could do something like CDI event and push directly to 
Elastic Search. So I would say if you don't have Kafka installed, maybe I will use the internal case, uh, internal integration case, because uh, uh, for Kafka you will need uh, three zookeepers and three brokers, and someone will have to run it. And just for that, this is a little bit overkill. Then uh, what you could do is, to, um, I mean, the question is how bad is it if the data is in MySQL but not in Elasticsearch, for instance, right? So this is because it is impossible to have two-phase commit between MySQL and Elasticsearch. But the trick I told you before with the transactional CDI event, you can apply here as well. And thank you for watching this show. And uh, your name is uh, Vagelis, which is similar to a great Vangelis. It was so great. It, he, he did some synth music. So we actually discussed the Glassfish versus Payara. <coughs> and now the last question. What's your opinion regarding Mokito versus embedded database or unit testing? So um, embedded database or use unit testing. So, so I do some projects in the clouds right now, and I don't even attempt to have embedded database. So what we always do is we try, you know, every developer gets an own account, cloud account. And we try to use the real thing. It is fast enough. So the question is, why I should emulate, you know, something on locally if if I can do use the real thing? So I would say, use the real thing first. If it doesn't work for you, so uh, do something which is very like the real thing, right? So uh, use something which is very similar to the real thing. And unit tests. What I observe, I also performed a lots of um, code reviews um, recently. And they are, I see more and more misuse of unit tests just to increase the code coverage. And how to detect that? Very easily, for instance, you will you will find that you know all enums and exceptions, default constructors or JAXRS resources, which are actually empty, they are just delegated to the boundaries. Um, there are lots of unit tests which cover you no know, one by line, one by one. Line by line, which cover line by line, you know the uh, the code, which is really bad for everything. First, you still have no idea whether your code is actually working. Second, every minor change in the production code, uh, uh, code will uh, cause you know uh, a, a huge amount of work on the unit test. So this is a really bad practice. I don't know how to call it over uni unit over unitification. Maybe um, there should be a name for this anti pattern. But um, really bad idea. So I would focus on integration testing or even system testing. So start with black box first, and then you know start a little bit, uh, and then um, implement unit tests afterwards. And unit tests are a great vehicle to um, to be more productive. For instance, recently I had to to integrate um, regular expressions to a project, and I already knew this is going to be harder for me, you know, to, to, to implement a nice uh, regular expressions. So I started with unit tests, you know, to test the regular expression, and if they worked, the unit test remained, and I just embedded the regular expression code to the real thing and implemented system tests for that. So, um, and I saved time with unit tests. Okay, so um, this time we are on time, I hope. So let's see. Yeah, no further questions. Ah, this is Mr. C. Busta Mantem from UCSA Java. Uh, I I still have a monolith, very good, uh, with JSF and Payara, also very good. And my question is, do you think I can make migrate that to Quarkus to use the developer mode? Um, there is a plugin for Quarkus with uh, JSF extensions, so uh, JSF should work on Quarkus. And if the uh, JSF extension is implemented right, it should work in development mode on Quarkus. Because um, all the extensions are, how to call it, are real extensions if they are compilable with to native image GraalVM and they should work in development mode. So this is the deal and they have to be documented. So this is like, you know, um, almost like Java E where we had, you know, the spec, the TCK, and the third thing, uh, uh, spec TCK and the reference implementation. So in Quarkus, if there's extensions, you you you, you have to be sure that it, it runs in development mode, GraalVM, and comes with nice or contributes the documentation. Um, okay, so um, I answered you a quick question. Um, now let's see. Oh, we have a lot of questions here. Um, 
So uh, during Jakarta 1, Arya mentioned that there is a plan to decouple the components from Glassfish to independent spec implementation. Um, yeah, the, in Jakarta E, we get something like Jakarta E core profile. Maybe this is what Arian mentioned. But what Arian does, it has lots of fun refactoring, improving the quality of Glassfish, uh, and then picking the stuff to Piranha. But I recorded within one hour conversation, actually today. So um, wait a couple of weeks on AXFM and you can listen to the entire conversation. Then, uh, Mr. Hard to tell. I everyone is self-organized teams versus teams with team leads. What your thoughts? Um, it depends on the on the lead, right? So if the lead is nice and a leader, it means uh, everyone likes the lead, and uh, it is just you know like uh, I would say a guy or or gal who everyone can work, work with or like work, then then go ahead and 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 use the lead. But self-organizing teams also depends, right? So if the all the developers are internal developers. Sure, they should self-organize. But you know, in some projects, I see teams where every developer comes from different company, and every company follows different agenda. So for me, I, I would say it is then harder to see how they would, you know, uh, self-organize themselves. So that's the problem. And all, what I also see is that uh, so just you know the trend in self-organized teams that what I also see is that, you know, something like uh, metrics, for instance, system tests, stress tests, uh, tend to be, you know, um, under underestimated. So put it this way. Um, ah, Nebraska. This is nice. Nebraska. So Jeff, uh, question to you, Nebraska. Uh, do you have snow already? I think so, right? Uh, or is it Nebraska? Maybe. Um, I think team lead today is someone part of an anti-pattern, anti maybe. Uh, I mean, there is always someone who is a kind of a leader, right? Whether you call him team lead or not. The question is, you know, what, what would they expect from a team lead? Let's say if I would a project with James Gosling, I would like that, right? <laughs> so this would be my team lead without, regardless whether he is the lead or not. I just don't care, right? Um, so... Uh, Jeff Rogers asked me, so, so uh, using observes would not be a good method to apply updates to some other objects that are listening to for events? It could be, but this is additional overhead and it's harder to debug. So you can absolutely do this. So if you have a monolith, which is larger, instead of using, you know, um, microservice, I would introduce a CDI event. Another friend of the show, Frank Ricobono, asked me, with using a real database, how do you make sure your tests are isolated. Um, because you can very easily provision the database on the fly. So um, uh, I actually don't know whether my database right now, um, whether Docker is running or not. Otherwise, uh, maybe I did it already in the show. I say st start Postgres in Docker and it's already up and running on my machine. But if I'm in the cloud, what you can do, uh, let's say with AWS Aurora, you can provision a database, which is serverless. So you pay per invocation, Aurora is Postgres, and then you can move one minute back. So you have, you know, the clean slate again, or uh, you can reprovision the database. Or if you have uh, something like DynamoDB, you can just delete a table and create a new table. And um, so I would say, as is in the cloud, this is not very complex to reset the database. And we already started with it in Docker, and before Docker, I think it was it was 2010. I used Vagrant for that. So actually, in the first project I used that it was before Docker. I installed um, Oracle on Vagrant. I think it was Oracle, and then could reset the entire environment uh, to my initial state. So you can just do this. Minus four Fahrenheit, Jeff. Um, the question is how much how cold is in Celsius? I think minus four Fahrenheit is already cold. Celsius could be even colder, I think. So um, we made it. Uh, there is, um, there are no, yeah, no questions on Twitter. Um, maybe what I forgot to show you today is there are some interesting um, episodes. Um, AWS Lambda Power Tools for Java. This was interesting one with uh, Solution Architect on AWS. By the way, on Twitter, I asked, you know, what's the difference between Solution Architect and Architect? Because 
was interesting because uh, what I noticed in the recent years, there are lots of solution architects, and the, the term solution architect was not, you know, uh, known to me. And this just exploded. I never got so many tweets. So be careful with, uh, you know, asking about solution architects because um, I said, okay, then I am problem architect, and we can pair with solution architect, and there is no, we can generate some, <laughs> some money. But um, yeah, this was just fun. Then um, a great story. Another uh, podcast episode with Jürgen Albert. And um, so uh, Meetup Airhacks. So this is like the platform where this show is announced. And uh, oh, we already have 680 air, hacks, air hackers, which is nice. And uh, the next uh, event is um, effective. Oh, I have to mention this. Effective serverless Java functions with MicroStream. It is for uh, serverless Singapore. But uh, the point being is... The uh, gentleman, Jürgen Albert, asked me uh, or wrote me a message on, on, on meetups that, that I'm actually against OSGI, which is not true. Uh, in, in business project, I don't see the point of using OSGI, but it's not like I'm against because um, I really highly appreciate how well OSGI works on Open Liberty, but I don't like to implement that. So there's two different, you know, two different uh, point of views. But um, where is the, the uh, podcast here? And so I invited Jürgen to my podcast, and it turned out that Jürgen is actually the chair of SGI, and we had still a really nice discussion, because Jürgen is very pragmatic. In the past, if I, you know, negatively just, or just mentioned OSGI, I get lots of heat from the OSGI community that I'm, you know, um, I'm thinking in monolithic ways, and I'm against modularization, but Jürgen was really nice, and we had a nice conversation about, um, about what is the added value of OSGI. And um, so also a nice conversation with Gunnar Molling. And Gunnar is uh, the, the main guy behind Debezium. And there is a great tool. He wrote Casey Cartel, which is a command line tool for Debezium management. So if you're using a lot of Debezium, check out Casey Cartel. So this is the tool here. And it's always nice you know, to uh, I know Gunnar for years. So it's nice to have a chat with him. And um, also a nice chat with Emily Junk. But I think this was already... Um, I already no. Uh, it was uh, after the air hacks about micro profile of height zero. This is what happened in the world. And uh, thank you. We will reach soon 700 attendees, and I will an announce two other Java user group free sh shows here at Meetup. So let's see. I think um, I think we covered everything. So we have still. Um, how to implement a bulkhead on the entity manager level inside the microservice without creating a new one? The goal is to guarantee that GMS consumer always has five connections available. On the entity manager level, bulkhead is actually, if you think about this, JDBC connection pool. So the max, um, uh, the max JDBC pool max size is the bulk bulkhead because you are not you are not able to have then more than five parallel connections if this was the question but um what's what you're asking me the goal is to guarantee that gms consumer always has five connections available to entity manager this is what you would like to achieve so um okay this is the other way around so we have let's say then this is completely different what you what you would like to achieve then let's assume we have 50 JDBC connections for Entity Manager, and you only would like to consume five, and you have 10 consumers, something like this. So um, we, we have 50 in total, and it should be guaranteed Then you only get five. So how to do this? And um, there is, in MicroProfile, an annotation called Bulkhead. And uh, in Bulkhead and uh, Asynchronous, you get something like Connection Pool, so um, if you have bulkhead 5 and asynchronous, what happens then? Um, you get, uh, yeah, you, you, you get, there will be no more than five parallel connections. So this is where you can do that, right? You know, without creating a new one. Okay, so, um, so what to do is you have uh, 50, 50 uh, connections in total, JDBC connections, then uh, you can... Uh, you don't even have to do this. You have five connections in total, right, from Entity Manager, and then you have one bulkhead with uh, one method with five connections. And if you have uh, another method with five connections, you have to increase the JDBC connection pool to 10, of course, right? 
Okay, and if you're running in the cloud, so use something like RDS proxy, which uh, if you have serverless uh, in the front end. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you. I actually forgot to send it. <laughs> this was my hello at the beginning. Forgot to, to, to click the enter. So then I would say thank you a lot. It was uh, a real fun again. So um, nice, nice community. And see you next time in February. And um, almost around the corner... There are the next workshops, which should be fun. This is AHEX Live. And um, we go serverless architecture with AWS Lambda, but uh, it is serverless. But uh, actually, we ship the entire microprofile monolith as serverless uh, AWS Lambda. So it's not as crazy as it seems. We only will save a huge amount of money. So this is what we will do. And the next is even more interesting to me, maybe interesting to you. We will build, uh, I will show you reusable patterns, which you can. Um, as Java code, so you can say, you know, new microservice and you get the entire cloud environment. So this is what we will discuss and I will walk through the code. So um, the, uh, one is, okay, not around the corner, it's end of, end of March and the next one is in May. Okay, thank you a lot. See you next month. Bye.